Right, moving swiftly on, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to two distinguished people who are very much committed to making ESCO as practical and as real as possible. I'd like to introduce um, Gert. Gert, how on earth do I pronounce your family name? Hootskalix. Hootskalix. Yeah, okay. So Gert and I, <laughs> I think that's probably easier. Um, Gert is the vice chair of the ESCO maintenance committee. Um, but what she does every day is to work for the VDAB, which is the Flemish Employment and Vocational Training Service here in Flanders. Uh, she's also on the Socio-Economic Council of Flanders um, for the development of Competent, which is uh, based on the Rome version 3. Is that right? And I cooperate with them. She cooperates with them. Or rather, they cooperate with her. I think it's probably that way around. <laughs> Then sitting next to Gerd is uh, Professor Mike Campbell. Um, Mike is also a distinguished member of the ESCO board. So he's one of those people, if you don't like what you see, you can go and talk to him and he can explain why it is the way it is and why it's good that way. Um, he is a visiting professor at Durham Business School in the United Kingdom and has been on the expert group that produced the new skills for new jobs report that went to the EC. We're going to try something a little bit different. We're going to do an interview format. So the first thing I'm going to ask both Mike and Get to do is stand up. No sitting around on this stage. Ha! And would you like to move over to the podium? You can stand either side of the podium. We're going to sing a duet. <laughs> Mike, first question to you. It has taken many years to build the ESCO version zero. And I think many years is not an exaggeration. It's been taking a lot of effort. Was it a good use of resources? Should we have been doing this? And what are the benefits in real terms? I think if I have the first slide up, please. Thank you. That is the wrong slide. <laughs> Keep moving through. Next one. Look, back again. No, back, back. that's the wrong presentation. <laughs> While um, maybe I'll give your presentation and you give mine, <laughs> which show semantic interoperability at its maximum. Um, I'll, I'll start, but um, it will arrive, I hope, very, very shortly. So the question is, you know, what, what's the point of all this? Um, there we go. Is it appearing? Excellent. Um, and, and the central issue is, you know, what it says on the tin here. Um, better skills-based in particular, better job matching in general, but skills-based job matching in particular between the people who are looking for jobs and the vacancies, the jobs um, that actually exist. That was the starting point for this, as Xavier explained this morning um, on the new skills for new jobs work, and that's where I come to um, with it. It doesn't, um, uh, ESCO doesn't actually perform the job matching itself. What it does is it allows labor market actors to exchange information like vacancies, um, and CVs and hopefully in the future curricula, despite there being, you know, 22 different languages, different IT systems, um, different classification systems, the idea is that you have uh, a common basis. So in that sense, we think it's a very, very desirable objective and the specific benefits are listed um, on the slide. If I had more time, I could go through them in detail. But just to say this, perhaps, that of the three pillars um, of, the, um, of this single tool, if you like, I, I think we've spent a lot of time today talking about skills and competences, and I think that's absolutely right, because the qualifications and jobs agendas are more highly developed, um, I'd say, in the European Union. 
uh, and the skills and competences agenda um, needed addressing urgently. And it needed addressing urgently for two other reasons as well, is that um, firstly, as we see in the PIAC results, there is not a great alignment between people's qualifications and skills. And secondly, an increasing amount of job search and vacancy filling uh, and labour market adjustment takes place online these days. So that had to be an important um, consideration um, as well. And what we're trying to do is build, as Xavier said this morning, these bridges. Two sets of bridges, if I can put it that way. One between education and the labour market and the other between employers uh, and job seekers. And that should uh, enhance occupational and geographic mobility. I'll give you just one statistic on that. Um, there's roughly, in the European Union, about 16 million people who live, who were born in one European Union country but live in another. And that's a very rough estimate of the number of people, crudely speaking, um, who are from one country but work or have worked um, in another country. And as you know, Eures have got about, what, about one million vacancies um, on their books um, um, and um, about one million uh, CVs on their books as well. So in all these cases where there is um, cross-border movement, where there is migration within the EU, they're the occupations, they're the uh, skills and competences that we most need to think about very carefully. And then finally, for the anoraks amongst you, like me, if you're interested in labour market intelligence, then potentially in the longer run, ESCO could be very, very useful by doing for skills and competences um, what other systems have done for occupations, jobs and qualifications. So I think that's not a bad list of benefits if we can secure them uh, and a good use of the scarce resources that we have available. Okay, I'm going to have to push you though a little bit more. Um, you've outlined some of the benefits, great. We're all sitting here in Brussels in this EU bubble and this all makes perfect sense to us, but who are the real people that are actually going to benefit? And how is ESCO going to help them? Outside of the EU bubble, outside of Brussels, in the real world if you like, How's this going to work? Well, uh, of course, a lot of us um, who've been working on this uh, actually work outside the EU bubble, which is quite a handy um, thing. And that relationship between us and colleagues who work within the European Commission is, I think, um, one of the good ways about how, how this has been working. Um, but more specifically, you're right, it'll only make a difference to the real lives of people on the ground, job seekers, employers and others um, if it is widely understood, widely developed and then widely utilised. And <clears throat> again, I've tried to list here, the, in, in my view, the four um, socio-economic groups of people who stand most to gain from this. Um, so, you know, ob ob the, the first one that's blindingly obvious, of course, are, are intermediaries brokers who are in the labour market, education and training business. Anyone who kind of tries to straddle these markets will massively gain um, from the utilisation of ESCO. But there's another group which hasn't been mentioned this morning, which are those people who work in the information, advice and guidance um, industries. Because that's very, very important. Quite often information, advice and guidance work revolves around uh, qualifications in relation to jobs and rightly so that's really really important but not so much around the skills and competences that those jobs and occupations particularly in growing occupations um, actually serve so um, they're, they're some of the sorts of people who benefit but I think job seekers and employers um, directly benefit um, uh, uh, as well because it gives both of them access to a wider market. I come back to the international point which again maybe wasn't stressed enough so far today yet. Um, what, we're, what we're most interested in here practically, certainly at level one or at least I am, is we're talking about jobs that are um, accessible to 
groups of people across the European Union. We're talking about employers who recruit across the European Union. So anywhere where there's cross-border transactions, and that can even be commuting, it doesn't have to be migration, um, then people and employers in that environment are those who benefit most, I think. And then in the longer run, I hope education and training providers too, um, by helping them develop their curriculum um, in respect of a, a more, if you like, learner outcome um, focus. And, and, and just to finish, um, more practically, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, increasingly um, people are applying and seeking, people are applying for jobs and employers are recruiting increasingly online. And I have to say increasingly without the use of all these brokers that I was talking about earlier, which is an interesting question in itself. So some of the direct beneficiaries um, I think we'll see this um, very much in, 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 in online. And how will that happen? It's because of all the things that Martin and others said this morning. It's because, because of in, the, the transparency it gives. It's because of the multilingual nature of it, the standard terminology, the standard classification, um, and so on. All, all those um, generate benefits. I, I like to think of ESCO, maybe it's a, a, a poor analogy, I don't know, but I think of it as a USB cable. You know, it kind of links all these otherwise disparate things um, together, if you think about it like that. And finally, just to say, we're, we're in the business already, as Martin said this morning, of dealing with about two-thirds of the whole European Union labour market. And probably by the end of the next year, we expect that to be more or less the whole shooting match, don't we? Um, uh, as well as, obviously, the, the transversal skills. But I ought to say it's the maintenance uh, um, the, sorry, the sector reference groups who are doing most of the key work on this, who are doing the detailed work of identifying the occupational program, their profiles and the relevant skills and competences um, that connect to them. <clears throat> um, two final things is to say, um, you can hear more about all this, there's a, a, a live demo of the role of ESCO on, um, in relation to European job search, in relation to Euras and the job mobility portal later this afternoon. Um, and also later this afternoon, um, as Martin's hinted, there's an interactive game um, where you can have a go at skills-based job matching yourself and see um, if ESCO is worth the money. But I, for one, uh, think it is. It's early days. Um, but the thing that will really make it worthwhile is if we can build up a community of users who are committed to this and use it in their own work. Very good. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to remind you that there's a Twitter wall and there's this uh, amazing communication device called a hand. And it's been working for many, many hundreds of years. Stick it up if you have a question. Otherwise, I'm going to come to you. So let's get some of those questions coming in. Uh, Gert, nobody can accuse um, ESCO of a lack of ambition. And we've just heard about total European coverage. We've just heard about increasing online job seeking. 4,700 skills and competencies. Oh, how's it going to happen in practice where it really counts between the education and the labour markets? Yeah, I would... Uh, Does this work? Yeah, okay. Uh, I would just um, like to put everyone's feet on the ground for a moment and uh, uh, talk about what happens in the labour market when they talk about matching. Actually, they are talking about a market process where demand and offer are met. And when you try to meet these, then the... No, Ben, wait for a moment. Um, when you try to meet these, that means that there are a lot of parties involved because it's a big market, labor market. So there are all these intermediate organizations that try to develop services to enhance this matching process. But there are also the stakeholders, what I would say the final stakeholders in the whole thing, and that's the job seekers and the employers. And when we know for sure from feedback from employers in our region that they are really going for matching 
with use of competences. They really want to do this and because they want more accurate matching. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's one thing we have to take in mind. But looking at the different parties there, employers, job seekers, there are also other elements that we have to take into account when we talk about skills-based matching. Uh, for instance, from employer's side, we know that the majority of the companies in Europe are small SMEs. SMEs don't have a, often don't have a separate personnel department. That means when we are going to match with competences and we would ask them, the employer, to define a competence profile. For instance, my hairdresser, after the end of a long day, she loses her assistant, she has to write a vacancy, and we ask her to define the competences as accurate as possible. She would have a huge and very complex and difficult task. If I ever, I would ask her just tell me what she has to do, I'll write it down, I wouldn't be able to follow her because she'd say that and that and that and that she has to do. So that's their language and I think it's important that we know that this is the language of the employers uh, there. And why? Because it's so close to their organization of the work and the business of the enterprise. So that's quite simple. The competences then are the know-how and the knowledge that are necessary to perform these tasks and activities exactly in the right manner. And within this specific company, because there's always the context, you can never lose sight of the context. If I would be a truck driver for a small brewery and deliver beer and wine and some other beverages to the local restaurants and bars, that would be quite different if I'm a truck driver in the, in the harbor in Antwerp driving a tank with dangerous liquids. Although there are some people that think that beer and wine are also dangerous liquids, of course. <laughs> but uh, you understand what I'm saying. You can never lose the context out of sight of your talking in, 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 in blind with your eyes closed. That's from the side of the employers. Uh, same things that are key issues on the side of the job seekers. If I look at uh, the titles of some vacancies, I don't have a clue what they are talking about. <laughs> so a job seeker has to find out what's exactly included in that vacancy to be able to make the first match on his own. Will I be able to do this? And if it's clear what he has to do, then this first feedback, touch, check, is easier. And then the next question he has to address is how can I show this to the employer that I can perform this task? And then maybe in the future new things will arrive because the traditional CV is on the move. New formats are there, multimedia is involved, social CVs emerge, and of course we also have, I think, new horizons to explore. How can we uh, help uh, job seekers to make it possible that in their e-portfolio or whatever you call it, or in the Europass CV or whatever, that they can add labor market activities with a stamp next to it from an employer or an assessor saying, we confirm officially that this person can perform this task, which is a quality label. Very important, I think. Very good. Did you want to show us a... Yeah, 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 because now we are starting with the real thing, is how are we going to support all this? And <coughs> the other one? Next one. Uh, the previous one. So um, how are we going to support all this? And I think taking into the fact, uh, taking into account that these people are non-professionals and you are saying it's more and more online. Mm. That means that the people have to do more and more on their own. They also want to do more and more on their own. So we have to support the self-steering of job mm. seekers and employers in this. And that means to me, that's my personal conviction, that you have to go close to the processes that are 
<clears throat> there in the people's minds, and that's recognition and association. If I show you a list of tasks, and you can immediately say, yes, 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 no, for heaven's sake, up, and then, then you can have a quick response. You can work with recognition and, and association. And then you start organizing I, the way you look at the labor market in a different manner. Put other glasses on and look at the labor market um, consisting of labor market activities that need to be performed. And the job is then what you could see on the screen now. Well, let's, let's just take this, bring it with me. Here we go. And we're yeah. going to walk off stage. Here we go. We're going to come to this thing. And you push yeah. this little button here and you, you tell us what, what, what are we meant to be looking at? Yeah, first, as the thing as a whole, uh, you can look at it from a, a one specific job, vacancy, and say which activities in this job are, uh, let's say, uh, niche activities, or which are basics. And then you can start reasoning around this in another manner. The same thing, if I may uh, use your example, Martin, uh, saying that you study theology, I would put you somewhere there if you would look at the labor market. And then you have to figure out and explore how you can get closer to a bigger demand or aim for a specific niche because of uh, certain competences or ambitions. But when you look at this and saying, okay, how does it work? How does it work with labor market activities? Then you can see that when activities change, the impact on the related competences, knowledge and know-how, immediately is inside. If in the market, for instance, I'll give you the example of uh, the solar panels, at a certain moment they emerge in the market, immediately two jobs that are uh, situated here, uh, the electrician and the roof tiler, um, when the demand for the solar panel goes from niche to a bigger market, suddenly these two jobs go from basic to shortage. And then that means that as uh, intermediate, we have to act differently. Maybe it's a regional issue, and then we can have a regional action plan. Maybe it's more a uh, bigger thing. Maybe we have to go in our training department and say, put installation of solar panels up front in the program. So it's another way of working. So I think it's very important that if we want to support people, that we stay very close to the changes in the labor market. Very good. Now, we have to move on because we're running a little short of time. Um, ESCO doesn't work in a vacuum. No. It has to function within a broader context. How are we in this room meant to understand that broader context of ESCO? Yeah. Um, do I we do have the next speak? slide, please. Yeah, this is okay. Um, so no system is on its own. No organization is on its own. And when we look at the labor market and what's happening there, then we are looking at the lower part of the uh, picture, the yellow zone. That's where life is. That's where it's happening. That's where the economy, social economy activities, where they change. And that's where labor market services are being provided. And where we cooperate with other organizations in the field or in the domain of education, et cetera, et cetera. And where we can have input. We see that there is a link with other systems because there, uh, yeah, the Belgian PES or the Flemish PES doesn't exist on its own. We work together with other Belgian PES. We want to exchange vacancies. We want to find uh, from the French-speaking region people to fill in our vacancies and the other way around. So we set up exchange of data in regard to vacancies and candidates based on the same system. So a common language which can e easily be understood we don't live, we are a very small country, uh, we don't live on our own in Europe, so this exchange between the public and private is even bigger. It's also with private. 
So all this means that you have to look at a picture where systems have their own purpose and they have their own dynamics. And it's not the same at all the levels. The biggest and the highest dynamic is at the bottom. That's where our economy is. If that dynamic is not the highest, then we have a problem. Up there, you see EQF and ISCO. I don't mean anything bad about this, but the blue color is another color because that are the systems that change at the slowest pace which is important because if ISCO, if ILO would change ISCO every three months, we would also have a problem. So when we talk, I want to readdress a question that um, uh, Pierre uh, tried to answer this morning. When we talk about uh, feedback and update of systems to keep in pace with what's happening on the market, which is quite essential in uh, regard to the ambitions and the policies of Europe 2020, we have to tap into the yellow zone because they are the first signs of innovation, they are the first signs of changing of labor market activities can be picked up. So when we do analysis of real-time labor market activities, then we can have, I think, an input for a systematic update at a higher level in the future. Very good. Now, again, I need to invite you back on stage. Here we go. I thought I was finished. No, you're not free yet. No, 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 no. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is an awful lot of information. But the purpose of this session is to really try and see how it moves from the theory into the practice and how that job matching works. You have to go back to your countries and use this system. Do you have any questions on what you've heard, or is it now all obvious? Here we go. Thank you. No, that's okay. If you could just state your name again. Uh, Tenko Itzanya from Croatia. Um, I would like to ask you what sort of in additional instruments you are thinking about to pick up these dynamics which are happening locally on regional labor markets. And are they going to be like in the labor force survey, which is one of the instruments which opened up uh, with international standards our ability to understand both the local and, and the national markets and wider than that. So are we trying to find a similar instrument, a new survey for competences, for example, which will then be translated at a higher level into uh, you know, understanding what the nature of the changes are, whether they're permanent changes, whether they're just transitional changes or perhaps local, like in a niche labor market. Uh, that sort of uh, capacity needs to be built up probably at a higher level, but some of it has to be done already at the national level. So I can see that there must be a lot of infrastructural development and institutional development before we can reach this aim. Very good. I'm just looking at the Twitter wall as well. We maybe need to create an inspirational program to make SMEs use and benefit from ESCO. I don't know if any of you want to comment on that. I was very struck by your comments on SMEs. I am myself, my company is an SME, and uh, I face some of the problems you were describing. So we've got two issues there. I don't know, Mike, do you want to have a go first at those two, and then Gert, we come to you? Um, Remember one word, particularly at this stage of, of development. It's ESCO, right? And it starts with the word European. You know, it isn't about national and local. You know, we, it would be completely impossible to develop a classification system for skills and competences across the 27... If you, if you think of the work that the, that the sector reference groups are doing, you know, what they're trying to do is to develop a set of, um, if you like, common or core competences that appear to be appropriate to particular occupational categories that can then be mapped against national and regional systems. Right? And that, that's when you get the interoperability, that's when you can get the translations, if you like, of one to another, and you can see where gaps are and you can... You can you, you, you can work through it. Um, so, 
I think the development of its relationship, its, its tessellation, if you like, in relation to national, regional and local skills and competences is a developmental thing and it's something that needs to happen between ESCO and the member states. It's not something that ESCO will do, you know, sat in an office in Brussels. That's the first thing to say. The second thing to say, and if I can just put a sort of wider orientation into this really, for me, we need to make some priorities for the future here, really. You know, you mentioned the 4,800 occupations, the 4,700 competences. You're mentioning the national and local level. I spoke to Jack Matthews from INSO earlier, and he was talking about European global relations. You know, if you think we're ambitious now, how ambitious would all that be? So you have to take a deep breath, in my opinion, and say, what should the priorities be? And I would um, reflect on what Gert said, two things. One, shortage occupations. You know, that's where the, pin where's the pinch points in the system. And to focus quite hard on those shortage occupations and trying to fill those. That's an obvious priority and one where there are real labour market benefits to employers and to individuals and to the economy. That makes a lot of sense to me. And secondly to focus on those areas where there is extensive cross-border commuting or extensive, particularly, international intra-EU migration. And, uh, and in relation to, to, to Jack Matthews' work, maybe uh, significant EU external migration or external EU migration. Because these are, the, these are some of the points where, at a European level, we can, we can add a lot of value. Very good. Mm -hmm. good. Before, I, before you take this last stand, we have a quick question here. Thank you, Martin. It's not a question. It's uh, some elements of reply to the question raised by our Croatian uh, colleagues uh, on what we're going to do with ESCO uh, when it comes to labor market intelligence. Um, if we want to help improving the functioning of our labor markets, including at the level of the European labor market itself, we need to know more about the trends on the labour market, in particular when it comes to requirements for recruitment and therefore skills requirements. And that is the reason why the European Commission has recently been launching a very, very interesting uh, tool, which is the European Vacancy uh, Monitor, which is part of the skills panorama. I know it's a little bit complicated to understand all these instruments. But the Vacancy Monitor is an instrument <clears throat> under which every quarter of the year we look at the content of the vacancies which have been notified either to public employment services, private employment services or other type of employment services. And we go and explore the content of those vacancies in particular in terms of skill requirements. And every quarter we publish a short bulletin on what are the top uh, gross occupations for instance. We do the same when it comes to intra-EU labor mobility. And for instance, we will every quarter tell you what are the occupations which are most in demand, not necessarily where there are yet acute shortages, but where those occupations are most in demand. And in turn, we will use this very specific, how should I put it, operational or real check labor market information, so not the statistical labor market information, but that which is important for the actors directly on the labor market, we will use it in particular to direct the job seekers towards where the jobs are, and in particular through specific targeted labor mobility schemes such as your first year job, for instance, which is going to support either a specific group of workers or specific occupation or detentions, or countries which are very much in need of labor force, such as, for instance, Germany, UK, or other countries of this type. So you see there is a whole series of instruments being developed and of course, the information we will retrieve from the European Vacancy Monitor and the European Job Mobility Bulletin will be more accurate, will be much better, once we will be capable of using ESCO to understand the information we get and to consolidate it. Because we get information from Belgium, from Austria, from Spain, from Italy, but it is very difficult to make comparison at the moment, to consolidate. ESCO will help us to do that just need to introduce yourself. Oh, uh, I'm Wallis Golan, the head of the unit which is in charge of, uh, what am I in charge of? Skill strategy, the European <laughs> skill strategy of the European Too Union much. from the angle of demand. 
labor mobility, including uh, intra-EU labor mobility, URS, uh, and uh, employment services. Thank you very much. Gert, the final word to you. No, no, no. I got a, a well, well, well informed backup for my question. To this question. No, no, it, uh, the, the, the question was more completely answered by Wallace than by me. So, but I think that uh, with um, uh, the new changes now uh, that we are doing with analyzing uh, the matching with labor market activities, that we will be able in the future to hand on or give input more accurate even to a higher level than now. Very good. Final thought. What do you want the audience to take away with them from this conference? Mike? Um, well, there's, there's such a lot, isn't there, I hope. I hope it won't be just a, um, a soundbite, as it were. But um, if I try and put it into a soundbite, I'd say um, an understanding of how ESCO can help you achieve your objectives in your organization and world of work, but I think more particularly how it can help you in that wider objective of connecting up the different parts of the education, labor market, and training system. Because at the end of the day, that's what all this is about. ESCO's one important contribution to that. And what it can do in that regard is to improve connectivity the connections between labour market actors, the connections between education and the labour market in different parts of the system, the connections between different parts of the European Union. So it's joining things up for me that's perhaps the, the key message. Very good. Joining up. Gerd, your final thoughts. Uh, I think my final thought would be I would uh, advise people when they are developing services or whatever for these uh, final stakeholders uh, that they take a step back from time to time and try to put themselves into the minds of these people in saying, can I work with this without all this professional background mm -hmm. knowledge that I have? Mm -hmm. Because if you take all that away, then it needs to work. And I think, uh, I think that's a good checkpoint. Uh, yeah. So checkpoints and joining up. Thank you both yeah. very much, ladies and gentlemen.